Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine, and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Hello and welcome to episode two of Girls on Film, the movie review show from a female perspective. I'm your host, Anna Smith, and I'm pleased to welcome two of my fellow female film critics to the show this week. They are Helen O'Hara, film journalist who writes for Empire, Time Out and others. Welcome, Helen. Thank you very much. And Larushka Ivanzada, chief film critic for Metro, who also reviews for The Times and BBC Radio 4. Welcome, Larushka. Thank you. Great to be here. This week, we will be putting new releases to the Bechdel test and welcoming a special guest onto the show. But first, a movie that everyone is talking about, A Star is Born, a Hollywood musical romance which is in cinemas now. Bradley Cooper directs and stars in the remake of the 1937 drama, which has already been remade twice with Judy Garland and Barbara Streisand. Now Lady Gaga steps into the role of the talented young singer who's discovered by Cooper's boozy rocker and whose career goes stratospheric just as his begins to decline. Can I ask you a personal question? Okay. Tell me something, girl. Do you write songs or anything? I don't sing my own songs. Why? I just don't feel comfortable. Why wouldn't you feel comfortable? Almost every single person has told me they liked the way I sounded, but that they didn't like the way I look. I think you're beautiful. So far, everyone seems to be going gaga for gaga in this film. Lurushka, would you agree with them? Yes, totally. And I think I was surprised by that because you think this is very much, it seems on paper to be a vanity project by Bradley Cooper. You know, he kind of went through that kind of transformative angst of teaching himself guitar for it and piano and he wrote the songs and it was very much his project and he got Lady Gaga on board. But she's kind of emerged from it as as the breakout star of the picture. I would agree. I think she's absolutely terrific. It's a very naturalistic performance and, mm. and, it, and it really does work. The fact that scrubbed of makeup, she does look like an, a sort of ordinary person and then this dramatic transformation happens. Mm. Helen, what did you think of it? I think that's um, that's all true. I think she's great in it. I do think that Cooper gives himself quite a lot, though. <laughs> I mean, because I, I, I feel like, and I think this is true of all the, this film, of all the versions of this film, mm. is that... It purports to be her story, but particularly in this incarnation, it's it's actually kind of his. Mm. And he's given, I think, a little bit more kind of of a past, a little bit more development and heavier, probably emotional lifting in some ways. Um, but having said that, you know, I think she's great. And every time she she sings, also the film really kicks up a gear like her. Her emotional delivery of the songs is amazing. Well, Helen, it's written entirely by men. So mm. Bradley Cooper, Eric Roth and Will Fetters. Do you think that shows in the final film? See, I think it does, because I'm not sure if she ever talks to another woman. I was trying to <laughs> think about this last night. I mean, there's a moment where she's praying with her dancers before going on stage. Maybe God's a woman. Maybe that counts. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, there's there's not a lot of women in her life. And I feel like there are women in Gaga's life. I'm sure there are. And and that felt odd. She gets a sort of gay best friend, doesn't she? Or she implicitly does. gay best yeah. friend. And, and that's great. But... Yeah, I think there's a, there's a moment with a little girl who says, you're really pretty, but I don't know if that really counts as interaction with with a woman. Yeah. Um, and then um, Dave Chappelle's wife, I don't know re- that they really talk very much other than about something which is a plot spoiler, but which is very sort of girly. Oh, there is a mention there. OK, but that's kind of also that thing connects to a man. So I don't know. Exactly. Well, she becomes an increasingly passive character, I think, as the movie goes on. In, that's fair, yeah. You know, so at the beginning, you sort of feel that, yeah, you're getting to know her. She's the, she's the character that sort of starts the movie mm-hmm. and it's her journey. And then by the end, she's seems to be yeah she's sort of slightly enthralled to her father and enthralled to the Bradley Cooper character and even though she sort of seems vaguely and enthralled to her manager the well, English it is manager. Yeah, the English manager who I was really not a fan of. I do have this sort of current <laughs> obsession. English baddie. I do have a current obsession with films with English baddies who are really, really bad actors in American films. And I don't know whether it's just that, that they are sort of directed to talk in a certain way so that Americans can understand them. But I had a problem with this because I think I've seen this in Pitch Perfect 3, Westworld and Bad Times at El Royale <laughs> recently. I'm starting to count them and notice them. So that, that bugs me. But um, you sort of mentioned, yeah, that she's increasingly enthralled. And I kind of feel this is obviously the Cinderella story 
story with all, with all the thrills that come with that because it is very exciting, mm. like a bit like in Crazy Rich Asians when you know basically a rich man sweeps her off her feet and, and watching that. And although I think the stardom element is probably even more seductive in this film and played harder, but at the same time, why are we still being told this Cinderella story of a woman who needs a man to make her a star? And even if, I mean, even if there's the Cinderella story is still something that plays, because it is a fantasy and it is a nice idea that anyone, it doesn't have to be a man, that anyone would come and fix your problems and give you lots of money <laughs> and, and, you know, everything would be lovely. That's great, but you can still have agency, surely. You can still be a part of your life. And I feel like that's the element that's, that's missing from this. And I think that Crazy Rich Asians did a better job of that. They showed her having a bit more say in her destiny, even if she did have... The crazy hot, crazy rich guy. Because I guess if if a star is born is sort of about something, it's about someone finding not only they keep saying not only just finding your voice, but finding something to say. Mm. And it's all about you know the fact that maybe she's lost her her way because she's been taken over by this pop Svengali who's you know ruining her natural inside voice. But you sort of she sort of goes well actually I'm not. This is the sort of music that I want to make all the way through. Mm. And it's only the Bradley Cooper character who goes no. You're the you know the girl I fell in love with wouldn't have been like that. And she's almost saying. Well, actually, I've moved on since we <laughs> fell in love in the parking lot, and I've got other things to say in other yeah. ways, perhaps. I, I, I think, yeah, her whole the whole idea that he's authentic and she's a sellout was was an odd one to play, and I, I don't think this is a spoiler. There's a great moment where her manager suggests that she should do something, and she gives him this incredibly flat look of <laughs> defiance, which I thought was brilliant, and it looked like something Gaga would do mm. um, and absolutely has done I'm sure in the past and I felt like oh we're getting into this now we're getting into her kind of taking control of her destiny and then that was it there was just that one moment of ferocity and then it sort of went it's interesting that we're all coming up with quite a lot of negatives or things we had small problems with but yet I still thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed it and I know Larissa gave it five stars <laughs> yeah so we're we saying it's a guilty pleasure despite all this we're we saying that it's something that you would recommend and who would you recommend it to I'm, I'm having a bit of the same reaction I did to La La Land, which is that I had a fine time while I was watching it, and every time I think about it, it, it irritates me more. And I'm having a little bit of that with A Star Is Born, maybe to a lesser extent, but it's still happening. I'm almost trying to fight it because I didn't think it was a bad film. I agree, but um, but yeah, maybe a guilty pleasure is a good way of putting it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's very classic old school Hollywood, and as you're saying, the Cinderella factor, and that's why we like it's got a comforting kind of zone that we like to sort of fall into and feel cosy and we know how it's going to end and it's all well actually isn't always all right but, but we well. know the pattern that it's going into and the buttons that it pushes and that's why it's successful yeah. but yeah I let it sweep me off my feet yeah. it was thoroughly enjoyable wasn't it I mean you mentioned La La Land do you think it's going to win Oscars people the Oscars love giving uh, films that pay tribute to them essentially and pay mm. tribute to stardom and pay tribute to Hollywood and A Star Is Born absolutely does that so I think and they also love actors turned directors historically as a, as a category that's done very very well um, so I think this is a major contender that's not to say I think it's the best film of the year but as an Oscar contender I think it's a real one to reckon with I would uh, put him probably above her I think the nomination might be the win for her in the sense that she's a you know, this is her debut film oh, do you think um, I, I, don't I don't know. think she's in with a strong charm but there's a lot of competition this so year a, for it. but you're yeah, right about him year. as well but, but yeah for him I think yeah. and, and not just for actor but also for director I suppose it could even sweep the five big categories which we haven't seen since Science I, of the I'd Land. say it might come back just with a best original song because the songs in it are actually songs really good, good yeah. Yeah. yes gosh they choked me up I, I'm not going <laughs> to lie um, we sort of touched on whether this passed the Bechdel test let's remind ourselves what the Bechdel test is um, it is a useful if potentially fallible test of a film's feminist credentials it has three rules one the film must feature two named women two they must have a conversation with each other and three that conversation must be about something other than a man. Now I think we have established that it sort of vaguely passes. Do mm. we think it passes? I don't think so. I don't think there's another named woman. Is, is there? <laughs> yes, because I couldn't find a name for, for that kid or the wife. It did occur to me that it, we don't know if any of the uh, drag performers are also trans. Now I think if they're just drag performers, if they're just putting on female persona to go on stage, that doesn't pass Bechdel. If they're trans women, obviously it would. Um, but I, I don't know. I, we don't really see them out, out of their makeup. 
We don't, and it is a drag club, and yeah. yeah so it's it's hard to know, but I think that's a really fair point, and we should explain for listeners that she she starts out working in one and singing in a drag club. Exactly. So that's where he discovers her. It's yeah. definitely a, a male perspective film. Mm, it's yeah. about his relationship with his brother, I guess, or, and the dog. Perhaps the even dog. More. Oh, the dog. <laughs> is Dogs amazing. called Charlie. The dog has a name. The dog is his dog. <laughs> yes, which is wonderful. So that's yet, why it has natural. Yet another male dog, dog, which is another bugbear <laughs> of mine. Right. Thank you very much. A Star Is Born is out now. That brings us on to our regular spot in which each of us will pick one film we've seen recently that passes the Bechdel test and one film that fails it. Let's start with our passes. Larishka, what's yours? Mine is Pilly, which is a small, low-budget film I'm very excited about, mainly because it's directed by this woman called Leanne Wenham, who I wasn't familiar with, but has, I see, been uh, nominated as one of the Screen Daily Stars of Tomorrow from last year. So obviously other people have picked up on her. And this is a very extraordinary debut film. It's about this uh, woman called Pilly, who's a single mother of two. She's living in rural Tanzania. And every day she kind of puts her hoe over her shoulder and she goes out to work in the fields, these dusty fields around for less than a dollar a day to feed her two children. And her life looks like it sort of might get her out of the fields when she has her eye on a market stall that she wants to open. But she has to get the money to open it. And she's given sort of 24 hours to find the money to get it together to get this market stall. The extra element of the film is that she's struggling to manage her HIV positive status in secret. And we find out that this is why her husband has left her, because there's a sort of shame attached to it. And as her health starts to deteriorate, the struggle with, with the getting the money together sort of fights against that. I mean, there are lots of familiar elements to this story. I feel like I've seen a lot a lot of particularly art house sort of foreign set films where somebody is struggling to do something else. And I think that um, Leanne Wenham almost recognises that there are familiar elements because she had a crowdfunding site for this film that was called notanotheraidsfilm.com. Um, <laughs> you know, it has got very specific details. And I think this is because that it was based on real stories. So she interviewed about 100 women to make this film and it's made completely with non-professional actors and uh, 65% of them are HIV positive. So sort of getting their stories and the specifics of their stories is what makes this really stand out. It does feel incredibly authentic. I've mm. seen it and I loved it and I think you're right. I mean, she was out there living with these people and working with them. The producer of the film as well is very involved in, in dealing with HIV patients. So I think, um, yeah, it feels very authentic and also um, the act, aspect in which it passed the Bechdel test. Mm. Do you want to speak a bit about that? Well, it's an incredibly female-dominated film and what's interesting, although the man who owns the market stall that she has to give the money to, the man who has power in the story, he's he's one central figure. But it's very interesting. There's a, a female council that she has to go to she's trying to sort of community rung it's not sort of clear what they do but they basically dole out money within the community and she has to approach them and try within 24 hours to get them to all agree to give her the money so the women hold the power within the community in a way that I'd not seen before and obviously it's based on the reality of their community life that's a big thumbs up for Pilly then mm. thank you very much Helen what have you chosen for your pass well I've gone a little bit further back and this is a technical pass but I think it's a bit of a fail so I wanted to talk about that it's Ant-Man and the Wasp which is the most recent of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's another superhero movie, yes. Uh, this is the one who shrinks, played by Paul Rudd. Um, and the wasp of the title is essentially his girlfriend, or at this point ex-girlfriend, Hope Van Dyne, who's played by Evangeline Lilly. And in this film, she and her father, Hank Pym, played by Michael Douglas, are trying to get her mother back from the subatomic realm. Look, she shrank too far. It's a whole thing. Don't even worry about it. So she's played by Michelle Pfeiffer. Now, this film passes the Bechdel test because there was a screen uh, moment early on where Michelle Pfeiffer talks to the young, the, the child, Hope. Ah, yes, right? correct. And then there's a moment later on where she possesses the body of Paul Rudd in in order to talk to her daughter. So technically it's a woman <laughs> talking, but also it's a man talking. Mm. And it's just really disappointing to me because I'm a huge Marvel fan. I'm very lowbrow. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a I think it's a great experimental cinematic universe. I think it does wonderful things. I think they've had some great female characters. But this is their first female title character. And they have a film that does her no justice whatsoever. She has no interior life in this film. She has no independent art. She has some great action scenes. Um, but we don't see anything of her life. In contrast to Ant-Man, we, we meet his daughter, his ex-wife, her new husband, his friends and colleagues. We see his living day we see his routine there is none of that for hope and and i just think it's a completely wasted opportunity and a really uncharacteristic misstep for this studio now their next film is captain marvel which i'm super excited about because that's their first proper female lead and it looks wonderful i've seen the, you know just the trailer but I'm, I'm really really excited about that but 
I mean, come on. This was disappointing. <laughs> yeah, Marvel take note. Absolutely. Agreed. So that, that just shows the, the test can be fallible because, yeah, and even oh, yeah. though, you know, she's in the title there, as you say, yeah, very rightly. Do you rightly. feel sometimes that they just, like these big studios just do, because they know about this test, just put in a token? I genuinely think that's true. Um, it's starting to happen. I, I think, think it is starting so. yeah. to happen. I yeah. think there are two subsequent tests that, that people should consider. Have you heard of the Macomore test? No. That's basically there has to be a female character who has her own independent story arc which doesn't have to do with being uh, in love. Okay. And then the Furiosa test, which is, does it make uh, sexist men mad? <laughs> <laughs> and if it does, then it passes the Furiosa That's test. Brilliant. Now, if you put those three together, you get a pretty good idea of whether a film is feminist or not. Excellent. I think we might need to devise a new one for our next episode. <laughs> this is great. So uh, my pass for this week is The Breaker Upperers. Uh, it's a New Zealand comedy that's been bought by Netflix. I caught it at London Film Festival, and I tell you what, it's an absolute hoot. Have either of you seen it? No. It yes. is so good, you are going to love it. And the idea is that two women create a business where they break up couples for a fee so that cowardly men can dump their girlfriends without having to confront them and vice versa. Hello, break for reference. You want to be single by March? Consider it done. Just because we've got gay marriage doesn't mean we need to follow through, you know? I didn't vote for it. You weren't gay eight months ago, Russell. I want a nice, clean break. I don't want years of heartache and stalking and therapy and possible violence. <laughs> I will shoot your faces. You work for weak assholes who don't have the guts to talk to their partners. Yep. So this involves everything from the women donning police uniforms and claiming that people have gone missing to showing up at a gay wedding with a fake pregnant belly and going, you weren't gay eight months ago, Russell. It's brilliant. It's written and directed by its two stars, Madeline Sammy and Jackie Van Beek, whose characters Jen and Mel talk about work, they talk about their families, their booze intake, their sexuality, their own friendship... And they also interact with many other women over the course of the movie. It's hands down hilarious and it shows that a film can be diverse in terms of age, race and LGBTQ plus content while simultaneously being massively un-PC in a very funny way. So I think that passes pretty much every test known to man or yes. woman. Uh, before the podcast, I asked you both what you'd seen lately that fails the Bechdel <laughs> test. And you both emphatically came up with the same choice. What is it? It's, it's Venom. venom. <laughs> okay. or, or if we were to quote the song, Venom, Venom, Venom. Yes. Well, I haven't had the pleasure of seeing this Tom Hardy sci-fi, <laughs> so I'd love to know why you both seem to hate it so much. Larushka. Well, there are many things to hate about mm. Venom, but the main thing I hate about Venom is just how degrading it is, particularly to Michelle Williams in this film. I mean, this is a four-time Oscar-nominated actress. She's sensational, and there is... Her character, I mean, before we even go into her character, how she is dressed in this film, I just could not... <laughs> she's meant to be this hotshot lawyer, like, top of her game. And she is made to wear a Britney Spears era, like, tiny porn schoolgirl level skirt to no. work. Oh, my gosh. And you're just like, really? It's just embarrassing. Even her hair is bad. It's, it looks like a wig, even if it's not a wig. It's <laughs> it's not good. I, I think it's, it's one of these things where, you know, you have a couple of female characters, but there's no reason for them ever to come into contact. And, of course, they don't. Um, <laughs> uh, Jenny Slate is the other one. She is uh, a scientist working... Uh, uh, on various nefarious things for the villain of the piece she comes to it's a whole look it's not even bothered, it's <laughs> what, what is amorous. the actual story is it worth like encapsulating is, yeah, it yeah we, we probably should <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry the story is that uh, Tom Hardy plays Eddie Brock who is a news reporter who is investigating a story uh, and he's brought into contact with an alien symbiote. Yes, a creature remember that, that word. <laughs> mm, very important word. The alien symbiote needs a human host to survive in our atmosphere. It comes bringing superpowers with it. Uh, so that's super good if you don't mind looking like a giant oil slick with teeth which is basically what Venom looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, and they basically have to, even though Venom is technically a baddie usually in the comics, he, in this case he's kind of a good guy who bites people's heads off sometimes. Literally. And I kind of actually got lost with what Michelle Williams' function in the film was as a character because she's his girlfriend, but she dumps him and then kind of yeah. comes back just in, in order for him to sort of save her. Yeah, he, he, she dumps him for very good reason, which is that he absolutely um, betrays uh, her trust yeah, in on him. A, on a professional level, On a professional fact. level and gets her fired. Uh, and so she rightly dumps him, gets a much better boyfriend, it has to be said, <laughs> a much better boyfriend. And one of the nice things about the film is that they don't posture at each other. Yes. Um, I, will, I will give it that credit. Um, but she just has... 
nothing to do. I think I feel like if you get Michelle Williams, <laughs> use Michelle Williams. It's, Absolutely. It's insulting to do otherwise. This is like a superhero movie from about 1999. And we have come on, people. <laughs> and um, have men disliked this as much as women in terms of criticism? It's, they seem to have. It's getting quite bad reviews, isn't it? Yeah, it's had pretty bad reviews across the board. I think that's because uh, it's one of these films that doesn't understand the appeal of its central character. Venom is a bad guy. Let him be a bad guy. <laughs> I know, and they have to kind of like, yeah, defang it to make sure that they can get the rating, don't mm. they? I mean, I think you're, you're right, and the cast in it are terrific. You've got Tom Hardy, you've got Michelle Williams, you've also got Riz Ahmed. Mm. And I was thinking, as we we're talking about all these different tests that you passed, the Riz test is right. another one that's okay. come in. It's sort of inspired by a speech that Riz Ahmed did on diversity to Parliament. And it says, if a film or TV show stars one character who is identifiably Muslim, by ethnicity, language or clothing, is that character, one, talking about the victim of or the perpetrator of Islamist terrorism, two, presented as irrationally angry, three, presented as superstitious, culturally backwards or anti-modern, four, presented as a threat to a Western way of life, and five, which is the sort of more um, pertinent one here, if the character is male, is he presented as misogynistic? Or if she is female, if she's, is she presented as oppressed by her male counterparts? Uh-huh. And so. it passes. The, this uh, pass- I would argue it maybe fails two and four there mm. because his, his, he is the bad guy, so he has a nefarious scheme. And it does actually ultimately threaten not just the Western way of life, but all <laughs> ways of life. And number two, I mean, he is pretty angry sometimes, although in quite a controlled manner. He's more of a Mark Zuckerberg, so it absolutely doesn't... Yeah, he's evil Silicon Valley. Yeah, he, he, so it's very much not anti-modern, quite the opposite. So it passes that bit with flying colours. Well, that's another good one to know about. Thank you very much. Uh, my fail is a slightly debatable one, and it's actually a film I really like. Uh, it's Bad Times at the El Royale, which is out this week. Uh, it's a stylish, heavily soundtrack thriller with a Tarantino flavour that's set in a very seedy Tahoe hotel in 1969. The El Royale is a bi-state establishment. You have the option to choose a room in either California or Nevada. How'd you end up at the El Royale? The Ritz Carlton was booked. This place used to be hustling and bustling. Old Dean Martin even sang a song about it once. This is not a place for a priest, Father. You shouldn't be here. We might need to work on your sales pitch, son. (laughs) The El Royale, no place for a priest. Now, along with Jeff Bridges, John Hamm, Lewis Pullman and Chris Hemsworth, it stars several brilliant women, including the rising star Cynthia Erivo and Dakota Johnson, who's always great. And her character has a complicated relationship with her sister, played by Kaylee Spaney. But, okay, the thing is, as far as I can recall, the two sisters only really talk about a series of men and they don't interact with Cynthia at all. Helen, you've also seen the film. Would you agree with me on this? I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, if there's a passing comment between the sisters about other things, that really is the height of it. Um, It is about the relation of one of them with men. So, yeah, that is disappointing because, like yourself, I I enjoyed the film. I think there's great stuff in it. And I think Cynthia in particular, she is a goddess. This is only her second film she shot, I think, after Widows with Steve McQueen. Um, For those who don't know her, she starred in The Colour Purple on Broadway. She's already got a Grammy, an Emmy and a Tony. She just needs the Oscar to, to EGOT, which is, you know, entertainment's ultimate accolade. Um, and she, I think she'll get there. I mean, this is a phenomenal start to her film career. Absolutely. She's absolutely phenomenal in this. And she gets to sing in it as well. And oh, I've got God. the most amazing earworm, but it's pleasurable from mm. having watched this when she sings the Eiley Brothers at the beginning. Um, and she also has a really good moment where she does give one of the male characters hell and really sort of picks him down. And, and we can't really say what it is, but no, it, you'll know, you know the moment I'm talking about. And it's like, Yes, in your face. So, uh, yeah, that is really good. But a little bit more interaction would have seemed just more naturalistic. I mean, often with the Bechdel test, I feel it's not just about being feminist. It's about women do talk to each other in real life. That's how it works, people. So, yeah, maybe a fail for that, but a thumbs up for the film in general. Absolutely. Our Woman of the Week this week is the great Carol Morley, the British writer-director who made Dreams of a Life and The Falling and who's now exploring the mystery genre in Out of Blue, starring Patricia Clarkson as a troubled detective. Out of Blue comes to UK cinemas on March 22nd, but it's also been showing at London Film Festival, where I caught up with Carol. Hello, Anna. Hello, everyone listening. Oh, well, it's such a pleasure because we're big fans of yours. Love The Falling, love Dreams of a Life. And Out of Blue seems like quite a different kind of genre. What what possessed you? What what gave you the idea? (laughs) Well, every time I make a film, I think... I I never want to 
you know, retread what, what I've done before. And I just love to uh, reach out and push the boundaries. And not, I don't think it's like a deliberate thing. It's just sort of like it feels right. You know, it just feels right. So it's not like I have some master plan, but without a blue, it takes a female detective and looks at her world and that idea of like exploring the female investigative gaze uh, was a joy because I think all the films I've done naturally not with any force <laughs> naturally look at female subjectivity and what it is to be a woman um, it's natural for me to want to explore that because you can bring yourself to it and your experiences of the world so I think yeah without a blue it was like looking at um, it's a neo-noir, so it's, it's referencing old film noir. In old film noir, you have the, often the male detective or the male, the trusting, the person, the male that thrusts the narrative forward. And then you have the femme fatale, the woman who brings him down, generally, or, you know, entangles him in, in her spider web. There is much we can't see, detect or comprehend, yet we spend our lives trying to get to the heart of this dark energy, this dark matter. Who are you imagining that the audience is for this film? Do you ever think about the audience? Or you just put it out there and just to see, see who loves it? Everything I make is for people, really, and not an audience, not like I'm going to reach this audience that exists in some market researchers or marketing uh, catalogue. I'm going to make a film that reaches people, and that's exciting because a film only really comes alive when it reaches people that respond to it. I do think your first audience, if you like, is your editor that sees the material and begins to, you begin to work on it as a something, what, what is it doing, what's that, what's that doing in the room with people? That's interesting, so the editing process for you, can you describe us, for example, in Outer Blue, how that worked and did anything change particularly from what you originally expected? I think in, in the editing process for, for every film it changes and uh, for every every director and there is that thing they say I don't know who said it originally because everybody says it now but it's a film is made in the screenplay it's remade when you shoot it and it's remade again when you edit but so a screenplay is something that enables you to go on a set and to and to, to manage and, and to schedule your shoot and to give the actors knowledge about their characters but then something else happens on set and you want to be open I don't mean about improvising dialogue but just that something you might have conceived shifts I've always thought that if you write a scene where two people have dialogue and they have a look between them that says it all you will just cut out all the dialogue but if you wrote a scene going two people look at each other meaningfully uh, that'd be quite hard to do but but you sometimes find those moments where you don't need anything else and and generally in kind of what I do I think I I probably overwrite. I think I probably overwrite, not dialogue, but just scenes, because I feel there's sort of potential that I want to explore and not like pin down too soon. So the editing process is really exciting. On, on Out Blue, I work with Alex Mackey, a woman, Alex, a woman, Alexandra, and we just had a brilliant time. At times I cried because you're losing things that you love. You know, from the beginning of cinema, there's been a natural length that works for a film, probably in terms of how long you need to get, can wait to go to the toilet or something, I don't know what it is, or eat or, or drink or something, but there is this sort of natural time. See, I, I don't want to make a three hour film, and there was probably a three hour cut of Out of Blue that I was in love with all of it, but you have to you know, lose the things that you love, so you're definitely reshaping, reordering scenes that you thought would work one place seem better in another place, so it's a very slow process, like a shoot is a very fast process, we had 28 days to shoot the film, the edit is a much longer contemplative period, I suppose. You pointed out that Alex is a woman, which is interesting because <laughs> it brings me to the, the question of how much do you like to surround yourself with female crew members? Well, I don't, again, Cairo Khan and my producer and me, when, when we're looking uh, for heads of department, we are just looking for the best heads of department. When we're looking for crew, we're looking for the best crew. So it's not about trying to be inclusive, it just isn't. But I think when you are a woman in a position of power, you naturally see people's strengths. 
somebody might overlook a woman or somebody that is, is being marginalized in some way in society. Someone just might overlook them, but you don't. So I feel that on every film that we do, there is a very an, a, a natural inclusivity to it. It's not a ticking box exercise. It's actually you just look and people go, oh, this is such a diverse set. And you go, oh, is it? Because to me, it's not diverse. You know, it's just like life. Because <laughs> Outer Blue is actually quite racially diverse as well, isn't it? Yeah, and I think it's just sort of like organic. And I think that to me is like why you want more women and, uh, you know, people that have previously been marginalised in positions of power because they won't be just uh, box ticking and going, oh yes, we've, we've got a good spread of diverse people. It's just like, yeah, well, of course, why, why wouldn't you? I, I think this idea of the director is dictatorial and somehow overly uh, manipulative. I mean, there is manipulation to it, but I think uh, there has been that image, and I think that's quite a, an image that doesn't suit every man either. I think that's probably why women have uh, um, been excluded one way or another from, because we know the statistics. It's the unconscious bias that we all grow up with, isn't it? Absol yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about Patricia. Yes. Absolutely stunning casting and yes. she is amazing in this film. I hear that she just went for the idea pretty much instantly. I think one of those exciting moments where you send a screenplay and we heard from her, I think we sent it on the Friday and we heard from her on the Monday which was amazing. And then I flew out and met her. She lives in New York, but she was in Los Angeles filming Sharp Objects, which she's amazing in, and uh, has received a lot of attention for, quite rightly. So I went to meet her, and we hit it off, and she just loved the screenplay, and she went, I am Mike, I've been looking for this part my whole life. She's uh, a larger-than-life person. She's uh, an utterly brilliant person that I'm proud to say has become my friend and she she gives everything to the part she's giving everything now to the publicity element which all films need so she's just a, a real champion of independent cinema and of, of, of uh, an older woman actor and I'm interested in watching the film of how the character Mike kind of bucks loads of conventions and constantly surprises you. There, there are so many things in this which challenge stereotypes. Do you consciously think about that or do you just create that sort of character naturally? Well, I have a real issue with at the moment with the the term strong woman that keeps getting bandied about, especially around film, because I think that a woman in a film should not have to be strong, she should not have to be a role model. I like, I prefer the term complex woman and complex representation and I think that when I write for all characters, male, female, for me I'm looking at complexity because that's what people are. So I'm looking at the, the gamut of human uh, emotion of, of, of the way that the mind works and that we're very unpredictable as people and that you know we react to situations in a different way so you might be in one situation and behave one way and in another situation and behave differently and that's what I explore in all my characters so to me when I watch a film and I see a stock character you know a stereotype a woman being just one thing or a man you know let's face it I just get it's just boring Tony, Tony, did you know that your nose could come from a different star than your hand? And that we're all here because a star died? Ain't it against God to believe that? It's not a belief, it's a fact. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening to Girls on Film and for sharing the show on socials. And huge thanks to my fabulous guests, Helen O'Hara and Lariska Ivanzada. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Girls on Film is an HLA production produced by Hedda Archbold and Jane Long. You just right there now? Yeah. It's pretty good.